The former Defense Secretary James Mattis, the keynote speaker tonight at the annual Al Smith dinner here in New York. He starts out making light, in a sense, of being insulted by President Trump at the White House meeting yesterday, but ends with somber patriotism. Let's listen. I do stand before you, as was noted here, uh, really uh, having achieved greatness. I mean, I'm not just an overrated general. I am the greatest, the world's most overrated. <laughs> and this is in no small part. I will tell you, uh, I, I owe New York. I owe New York for this because, Senator Schumer, have I thank you uh, for bringing my name up in a rather contentious meeting in Washington <laughs> where this grew out of. Um, so I would just tell you, too, that I'm honored to be considered that by, by Donald Trump because he also called Meryl Streep an overrated actress. <laughs> so I guess I'm the Meryl Streep of generals. <laughs> And, and frankly, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and you do have to admit uh, that between me and Merrill, at least we've had some victories. <clears throat> and some of you were kind during the reception and asked me, you know, uh, if this bothered me to have been rated this way uh, based on what Donald Trump said. I said, of course not. I'd earned my spurs on the battlefield, Martin, as you pointed out, and Donald Trump earned his spurs in a letter from a doctor. So, not in the least bit put out by it. And I think the only person in the military that Mr. Trump doesn't think is overrated is who you pointed out, Martin, and that's Colonel Sanders. Uh, but none of this can diminish the honor that I feel tonight of being here among all of you wonderful folks in this great all-American city. I started working in Washington, D.C., that I realized how easy I had it overseas in a combat zone. <laughs> Now, this won't be news to anyone in this room, but we're going through a tough, highly partisan time here in our country. And I've never been much for partisanship. I've always believed in bipartisanship, and the greatness of our country lies in teamwork. And my record on bipartisanship is clear. After all, I've reportedly been fired by presidents of both parties. <laughs> I will stand on that record. <clears throat> As many of you know, Donald Trump nicknamed me Mad Dog. But these days, I've turned over a kinder, gentler leaf. And I like to think of myself as less of a mad dog and more of an emotional support animal. <laughs> and that's really great, because now the airlines let me fly for free. It's been a year since I left the administration. Uh, the recovery process is going well. The counselor <laughs> says I'll graduate soon. Uh, a year is, uh, according to White House time, about 9,000 hours of executive time or 1,800 holes of golf. <laughs> and that's given me some time to reflect and to think about what our country and where it, about our country and where it's going. So I turn to history, for we've been through tough times in the past in our country, and often in history, I have found the way forward. It's tempting this evening to look back exactly a century to 1919, the year that Alfred Emanuel Smith first took office as governor of New York. His nomination as the Democratic Party's candidate for president, the first Roman Catholic to be nominated for that office by a major party, still lay nine years ahead. It was in many ways a troubled time. Anti-immigrant fervor ran high. Political corruption made national headlines. The glitz of the jazz, jazz age was real, yet working and living conditions for much of the American population were abysmal. The country was enjoying an economic boom, but a storm was on the horizon. No, Lincoln went on, it was not the foreign aggressor we must fear. It was corrosion from within, the rot, the viciousness, the lassitude, the ignorance. Anarchy is one potential consequence of all this. Another is the rise of an ambitious leader, unfettered by conscience or precedent or decency, who would make himself supreme. <clears throat> if destruction be our lot, Lincoln warned, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. I think often of Abraham Lincoln's Lyceum speech because it embodies both our greatest hopes and our darkest fears. Today, in our own time, we need only look around us. For decades, our political conduct has been woeful and a source of national paralysis. We have supplanted trust and empathy with suspicion and contempt. 
We have scorched our opponents with language that precludes compromise. We have brushed aside the possibility that the person with whom we disagree might actually sometimes be right. We owe a debt to all who have fought for liberty, including those who tonight serve in the far corners of our planet, among them the American men and women supporting our Kurdish allies. The phrase... And I would note that the phrase, all who have fought for liberty, also includes the generations of ordinary citizens who have embodied our national ideals and passed them down. In Springfield, Lincoln invoked biblical language to describe how the power of this common spirit protects our nation. He said, as truly as has been said of the only greater institution, your eminence, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So ladies and gentlemen, with malice for none and charity for all, let us restore trust in one another. Thank you very much. I want to bring in now CNN political commentator David Sword. Like David, good evening to you. So, hey, Don. so our guests tonight have been divided on General Mattis taking on right. President Trump in this way is, and in this setting. What do you think? So, I, I, you know, I'm kind of mixed on it, Don. On the one hand, you know, there was that line right there at the end where he said, you know, he referred to our Kurdish allies. That was a clear statement that he, as a general, as a former Secretary of Defense, sees the Kurds as our special operators, brothers in arms, and it's a comment on what's going on right now with our troops pulling back, and with Turkey, a formal NATO ally, but a country that's clearly working against our interests in the Middle East, uh, attacking those brothers in arms. On the other hand, I thought a lot of that was platitudes. General mm. Mattis is in a position where he could speak out and tell the American people what he really thinks about President Trump's performance in office, some of his inability to take advice from generals, from other leaders. And, you know, it's obviously a light occasion. He's supposed to be telling jokes. It's the Al Smith dinner. But I don't think he has taken this moment to really say what he thinks. Do you think this opens the door for further critiques? I mean, up to now, he has mainly said that uh, his res resignation letter speaks for itself. In some ways, it did. He resigned around that time when President Trump first signaled that he was going to pull out of Syria. And, you know, there were concerns about that policy leading us to sort of allow the resurgence of ISIS. And it was clear in that message that he didn't agree with that policy. But I don't think he has been full throated again about the fact that General, uh, excuse me, President Trump talks about loving the generals, listening to the generals. And mm -hmm. at the same time, he doesn't seem to listen to generals, foreign policy experts or really anybody in Washington who understands the Middle East. David Swerdley, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Don.